um, one of these confusing millennials that's managed to make a living through a weird hobby. This hobby involves making music on retro consoles and machines, something known as chiptune. With very little experience, I learned to compose through programming or hacking this Nintendo Game Boy using a piece of homebrew software called LSDJ, or Little Sound DJ. And basically what this allows me to do is to treat the Game Boy like a basic synthesizer. So I can command it to generate a tone, and then I can craft that tone into something that resembles a traditional instrument, like a kick drum, or a bass line, or uh, some melody. And uh, then with those instruments, I begin creating a song. But it's a Game Boy, so that basic, that chippy sound is probably something that you recognize from when you were younger, with like a Commodore or an Amiga or something like that. Um, it's essentially the most basic form of music, and what you can do with it in music making is incredibly limited, and yet you can create an array of sounds. These limitations force you to think very differently and to approach creation in an entirely new light. As soon as I came across this scene, I was hooked and with only a novice knowledge on how to make music, let alone make music on a Game Boy, I started to play with it and see what it could do and what I could do with it. I technically became a hacker, but it wasn't just me. There was an entire collective of people from all over the world dedicated to cracking the capabilities of this tech. Some on Commodore 64s or Amigas or Ataris. They were hackers with a do-it-yourself attitude. Uh, hacking their toys to make music and digital art. We had this ability to discover, create, and share with one another in this newly connected world, the digital age, which was born of this concept of the hacker epic, something that is completely at odds with the rigid practices of the industrial era. Ours was one of openness, creativity through computers, and the prospect of a better world with technology. And with it, there came a sense that anyone could be a hacker. So when I say hacker, it's probably not too difficult to imagine like a cyber terrorist of some sort, or maybe the Guy Fawkes cut mask comes to mind. Um, but it used to be that a hacker was an expert or an enthusiast of any kind. Someone who was passionate and inquisitive and found enjoyment in exploring, especially within technology. So with that description, surely any one of us could be a hacker. Because we're all curious with our technology in one way or another. I'm sure that we're all guilty of sitting up until maybe 3 o'clock in the morning on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube or whatever, knowing that you have to be up early, but the internet is that good, it just keeps giving. But before we had these pocket-sized supercomputers with the warranties that we wouldn't dare avoid, hackers would be known to explore their machines, crack them open see how they work, what makes them tick. If they didn't have something that worked for them, they would just make it themselves, build their own software, or build their own machines. If they hadn't, then the name, name Steve Wozniak or Steve Jobs would be meaningless to us. We wouldn't even have personal computers. The first home computers were built with the radical vision of the future, that everyone should own a personal computer. And this spurred generations of inquisitive creatives to recalibrate those very machines and repurpose them into something that they were never intended to be used for, like this Game Boy, for example. Hacker activity was known to be joyful, where overcoming <coughs> problems would arouse genuine curiosity and led to a want for more knowledge. Solutions would be deemed to have hack value if they were executed with cleverness, finesse or brilliance, and this made creativity an essential part of the meaning. So I was blown away by this idea that you could make music on a Game Boy. It completely fascinated me. Um, so I got myself kitted out. I dug out the old classic Game Boy from the depths of the toy cupboard, uh, dusted it off, revived it with some fresh batteries, and before I knew it, I had some songs. I, they were not good songs. There was such little rhythm behind it to make it feel like it was anything, and I was over enthusiastic with melodies. But they were mine, my own little creations, crafted from nothing, and I was so proud of that. So I put them online, and I waited 
get the email from Sony Records. But alas, no email. <laughs> but I didn't need a label. It was the spirit of the digital age. I could just put them online and hope that someone out there somewhere might be interested in listening. And they were, thankfully. Chiptune had its own community full of visualists, event promoters, and fans spread out all over the globe. So eventually I got to travel. I met incredibly talented, like-minded individuals that gave me the confidence to actually pursue a life of music, to follow my own path, and to keep exploring. It gave me this do-it-yourself attitude that really stuck with me. And approaching music composition with these constraints gave me almost a programmer's mindset. There would be moments in the writing process of serendipity, little happy accidents that would give birth to a new idea. And that kept the creative process forever interesting and refreshing. It was such a main, free means of self-expression because there were no standards to be met to define its quality. And it was accessible. I could be called this up for under 21. But honestly, overall, it was just really fun. And this essence of fun is rooted within that hacker ethic that I mentioned, uh, achieving unexpected results through playfully cracking the constraint. Before Chipchum, a movement surfaced in Europe in the late 80s called the Demo Scene. And it was basically the very first computer art subculture. And it started out as <coughs> what might now be considered any parent's nightmare, with a teenage boy alone in his room with a computer. But it's not what you're thinking. Uh, these computer-obsessed teens would flaunt their programming skills through cracking or pirating software. If any of you have been on Pirate Bay, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, and it was mostly video games at first, so they could hack their name into the high score so that everyone knew that they were the ones responsible for this crack. Eventually, these things called demos started to appear in the intro of this file. They wanted to, they wanted to flaunt their talents, so they create these audiovisual presentations that would play before you open up the software. And it had these insane graphics and music that was all really impressive at the time. They wanted to show what they could do with computers, their finesse. And sometimes they'd even talk uh, smack about other hacker groups presented for everyone to see, like an early but much more innocent and creative form of the demonic YouTube comment section. It got to the point where people didn't even care about these, uh, the software anymore. They just wanted to see these demos. They were really impressive. And eventually, these, they would team up to compete against one another at these things called demo parties, where huge crowds would gather to watch the results. They would compete like their lives depended on it, longing for that moment where Jaws just hit the floor in disbelief and people were just absolutely blown away by what they'd achieved. But what was it all for? Why did they do this? There wasn't exactly big prize money to be won at these demo parties, and they weren't exactly a big budget. So rather than focus on commercial gain, they worked to the extremes that they did because they loved doing it. It was fun. And like Chip Tune, which is basically like the musical love letter to the demo scene, this hacker movement was dedicated to overcoming limitations in a creative way and cracking constraints. They were making things with computers that people did not believe to be possible at the time. And because of their desire to create, some went on to form video game companies, or went into software development, or animation, quicksort. They went into a career that they had trained themselves to be. So I inadvertently became a video game composer through this weird hobby. Without really realizing the scope of it, I had created a brand for myself as a teenager. Marketing was something that almost came naturally to us who grew up with the internet, because creating an internet persona was as simple as setting up your very first embarrassing email address. And growing up, I was raised to understand the value of money. <laughs> Not as a goal in life, but as a necessity for survival. Because to make a living doing something that you love is the goal, right? And a hacker is not naive. They 
understand that income is essential to have that freedom to create and to control your art. But this transition from simply playing to making a living was a complete shock to the system of learning. Because I think as adults, we start to become systematic thinkers. Uh, we're constantly stretching logic, trying to find answers to things that might not necessarily have a logical outcome. We can end up valuing our own worth through keeping score, comparing ourselves with one another. Something that's very much the driving force in school with our grading systems and this competitive nature that we're told to find success. And teen years come with a natural desire, an ego. And this can give us the belief that anything is possible. But with an ego in the driving seat for too long, we can end up with a distorted vision of reality. A world of self based on our own perceptions and illusions, however diminished or glorified. Where our understanding of our abilities is not what they are right now, but rather what they should be in the future. And this can hold us back from moving forward. Or it can morph into confidence and arrogance, sometimes coupled with the desire for fame or money, mimicking others or following trends to find the spotlight. But arrogance front brings no contribution to your work, nor does it inspire others. In fact, it has the opposite effect. I'm sure that we've all experienced a feeling of anxiety or self deprecation or overthinking. It's, uh, the digital era can sometimes set the bar so high that it's almost enough to stop you from even trying. But make no mistake, we are all born creative. Our academic studies may tell us other, other from exploring and from being curious, seeing what we could do and not what we should do. We're all very eager to throw caution to the wind and break open our toys and go nuts with our imagination when we're kids, but somewhere along the line this adult state of mind comes into play and we don't believe in ourselves to go against, go against the grain anymore. But through discovering Chip June, I felt like I'd stepped into a world of the unknown. One that had all the right sights, signs and people. It resonated with me on a much higher scale. Here was a community of novice or self-taught artists, just like the demo scene, a breeding ground for self-expression with raw and unedited talent, an unfiltered emotion, and there was something really beautiful about that. And the scene had an attitude. It didn't care what we thought. It was really punk. It was playfully wild and free. Creatively beautiful in its own right, where having fun and dismissing standards was the focus. Each one of us had resonated with this movement in one way or another, and took it upon ourselves to get creative. To push the limits of our creativity, regardless of background or location. An artistic expression should be about absorbing life, our hopes and our fears and aspirations, and then creating something with it. There's a therapeutic value in creation when we can make sense of those emotions through giving them an entity. But if we forever fall trends and try to keep up, keep up with what's current, we will always fall behind. The limitation that we must crack is to overcome whatever holds us back from getting creative and having fun with it. It's the essence of the digital era where hackability is to participate instead of being a passive consumer. We can invent the future that we want and not the one that we're given. So instead of staying up all night passively consuming, find a community or people that help you out. <coughs> find your means of self-expression to create, to have the freedom to create and to create something that is truly yours. Approach creation with wonder, determination and curiosity and you never know what will come, come of it. But above all, strive for authenticity, where the desire is not for fame or money, or you will probably become lost. Find a bigger meaning, and whatever it may be, do it for yourself.
be a hacker and take the first step in this thing unknown. Thank you. 